Good afternoon. God is good. All the time. Well, half of you believe God is good. God is good. All the time. Okay, that's better. If you have your Bibles, please open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be in verse 16 through verse 18. Well, it's wonderful to see you all here today. And if you don't have a Bible, nudge your neighbor. I'm sure they'll share with you. It says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all compare. Who's ready for that? One of you. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or passing away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Lord, we settle our hearts before you. Ask you to speak to us, Lord. Show us what you have for us in this text, Lord. Minister to our hearts. Give us our portion. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul here in 2 Corinthians, he's given an account of his work, his laborer's fellow work, and their courage and patience under sufferings. And he opens this portion of scripture saying, we do not lose heart. The focal point of this verse is our heart. And it's very important to learn about because we all have one. He zeroes in on it, Paul zeroes in on it. And what he's saying is, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Throughout scripture, our hearts are addressed over 800 times. Throughout our lifetime, the average lifetime, a human heart will beat over six billion times. It's critical to our life and it's critical to God. It's mentioned many times in the scripture. I'm going to go over a few things, starting in Proverbs. And the question I want us to be able to walk away with today is, what is God's heart for us? And more specifically, what is God's heart for me? Proverbs 3, 5, Solomon would say, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Which is very interesting because Solomon was was widely regarded, the Lord said he was the wisest man to ever live. The wisest man who ever lived with all the resources at his disposal. And he writes, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Here's a person who could trust in anything, could trust in his riches, trust in his power, trust in his stature, trust in his good looks. And he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart. It means to garrison or, or to, to, put a protect, to put a protection around it. For everything you do flows from your heart. Guys, this is a big statement. Everything we do flows from our heart. It's the controlling force behind our behavior. Our pastor in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I come from, uh, Pastor Joe Foch, I'm sure some of you have heard of him before. He's on the radio and he's uh, sent greetings here before. Says, the heart always makes a convert of the mind. Wouldn't you agree with that? Proverbs 23, 26 says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. Solomon knows that if he has his son's heart, he has his mind, and he'll be able to influence, that will be influential in his life. How much more our Heavenly Father 
says, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. Psalm 51.10 says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Psalm 73.26 says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Who is the strength of my heart? God. Who is my portion forever? God is. John 14, 27 says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Peace cannot be found on the horizontal. Don't let your heart be troubled. Jesus has overcome the world. Psalm 37 verse four says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you, what does he say? You guys know this? He will give you what? He will give you the desires of your heart. But first, what must we do? We must take delight in the Lord. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. It means there's very little space between him and us in our brokenness. Very little space. And he says, he says, he's so close to us when we are full of sorrow. And for all of us Christians in the room, we know what it's like to be full of sorrow, don't we? doesn't matter which area of the world we come from, but we understand that this life is a race and in the race we have pain and we understand loss and we understand struggle and we understand trial, right? Because we've given our lives to Jesus and we know that this life in this world is not for ourselves. He says, I put very little space between me and you when you're brokenhearted. In Matthew 5, verse 8, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. To to understand pure is to understand no imperfection. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And in Mark 6, 52, They did not understand about the loaves, Jesus, after feeding the 5,000, for their hearts were hardened. So after all these things we're reading about the heart, the heart of God for us and our heart in response to God, there's times when in our life, our hearts are hardened and we don't understand. And if we're at a point in our life right now where we don't understand or we're confused or we don't understand what's going on in our lives, maybe it's time to look inside and say, have I hardened my heart? and to repent and to ask the Lord to turn our heart of stone into a heart of flesh, one that's receptive to what he has to say for us. All these authors, they all understood that the heart makes a convert of the mind and out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And the warning to us, and the encouragement I should say, not the warning, but really the encouragement is to guard our heart with all diligence for from it flows Springs of life. Amen. In the New Testament, there's six places where Jesus talks about not losing heart. We already read this one, verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we don't lose heart. In Luke 18, verse 1, Jesus says, speaking to his disciples about his return uh, after suffering and being rejected by that generation, right? Now, now think about this. Jesus spent his whole life with his disciples. They watched them. They grew up with them. They watched them perform miracles. They watched them uh, cleanse the lepers, heal the man on the Sabbath, the woman with a disabled spirit. They watched them calm the storm. They watched him have Peter walk on water. They watched him raise the widow's son. And he promised them that he would rise again. And he said to them to not lose heart. 
So if these guys who lived with Jesus, right, the 12 disciples, they lived with Jesus, they saw his comings and his goings, they saw his travail, they saw the sorrow, they saw the pain and the suffering that Jesus endured, they saw the miracles, they saw God in flesh in front of them, healing the infirmities, opening the eyes of the blind, fixing the legs of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the broken, healing the lepers. If he says, do not lose heart, what does that say about us? It's an encouragement to us to keep our eyes looking up. If, we, if they would be tempted to despair, shouldn't we? Second Corinthians 4, 1 and 16, we're already in 16, but verse 1 earlier in the chapter says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart. Paul, the apostle or messenger of Jesus Christ, says we are disciples of Jesus Christ, are ministers of the new covenant. And Paul would realize we would be tired out. So he says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart. He knows that we suffer persecution, that we have been worn down in our ministry. And he says, don't lose heart. As we fulfill the calling of our, of our Savior, he enables us alone. Galatians 6, verse 9, let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we don't give up or if we don't despair. Paul, writing to the Galatians here, gives a statement and a promise. He says, we will reap if we don't give up. This is not to say that failure or rejection aren't part of the process. You know, I think of uh, a certain athlete. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a big sports fan, and um, many of you are here are familiar with basketball, although I know most of you don't know how to play because I've played with you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but anyway, imagine being a professional athlete and losing over 300 games. 300 games, right? You're getting paid a lot of money to be a winner, and you lose 300 games. You miss 9,000 shots. Your team gives you the ball with five seconds left on the clock, 26 times, and you blow it. But then imagine that your legacy, because you never gave up, was six world championships and the best basketball player of all time. And you probably know who I'm talking about. So he says, never give up. He pushed through the failure and the loss. He never lost heart and he reaped his earthly reward. Jesus calls us to not lose heart in doing good. If we are doing good, Jesus has promised, we will reap what we have sown. That's a promise, church. You will reap what you have sown. So, so well. Ephesians 3.13, Paul to the Ephesians, I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. And Paul was practicing what he was preaching, saying, don't lose heart watching me suffer for the sake of Christ. And guys, he was writing the letter under guard, essentially imprisoned in Rome. And he was being persecuted for his faith. And he says, don't lose heart over what I'm suffering for you. This is your glory. Paul would later on die a martyr, beheaded in Rome. Church, we must understand that suffering is one of the marks of true discipleship. The church is the community of those persecuted for the sake of the gospel. Should we not lose heart when others suffer persecution for the sake of Christ around us, including ourselves? No, we should not. Hebrews 12.3, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. This puts the spotlight directly on the cross. Right on Jesus wrongfully accused, the target of the world's hostility, forsaken by his father, forsaken by his disciples. He would bleed his life into the ground for each one of us, for each one of us. Raise up your eyes into focus comes Jesus. 
the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And where is he now? Set down at the right hand of God. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Church, this is our inheritance. Each one of us, considering him who endured from sinners such hostility so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Finally, in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13, it says, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of Jesus with all his saints. Jesus calls each of us to be busy about his Father's business. It's not the easy ride. And he says, wide is the road and easy is the road and, and broad is the gate that leads to destruction and many there be that are on it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few will find it. Church, we are the few. And if you haven't found it, he's coming at any time. At any time. Jesus calls us to remain faithful in spite of our circumstances, in spite of our weaknesses of our heart, in spite of what's going on on the horizontal. He calls us to keep our eyes fixed above. And there are people in this room right now, I know a few of you, who have every reason to lose heart, looking at the horizontal. Things aren't going well. There's pain in your life. Some in this room have lost a child. Some have lost a spouse. Some have lost a marriage. Maybe you have a prodigal. Loss of your health. Loss of your living circumstances. Loss of friendships. Loss of a job. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Jesus says, look at me on the cross, despised and rejected of men, and now I'm seated at the right hand of our heavenly father. That is our same inheritance. Take heart, church. Stay busy about our father's business. The question is, does my heart beat for Jesus? Is, is my heart his heart? Is it pure? Is it tender? Is it guarded? He has overcome the world. We must delight in him and he will give us the desires of our heart. Verse 17. I'm sorry, the second half of verse uh, 16. And guys, I only have three hours, so I should be able to get through this. <laughs> I'll finish up quickly. I know Chai is right after this. I don't want to keep you. Verse 16, the second half says, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. The body is dead because of sin. Nobody's escaping that. If we, are, we, we come from dust and to dust we shall return. And here, Paul is saying, our inner self is being renewed day by day. To be renewed means to be resumed, to be reestablished or revived. It is restoration of what has become faded or disintegrated so that it is new, changing into something new, something better. Our purpose is being refreshed day by day in spite of the death of our, ex of our exterior. Now, Paul understands how far we can fade in such a short period of time. We become so easily distracted with the cares of this world. We become, we become consumed with anxiety, anxiety about this fallen world, our fallen nature, and our own desires draw our attention from the moment we wake up. Oftentimes, even in our sleep. I want a car in my sleep once. You see these examples everywhere. If you turn on the TV and you see all the commercials, Botox, and you see Ozempic, these pills, weight loss pills, and make yourself look good pills, and make your skin glow, and you know, make your lips bigger, and all these things. We obsess over our image. We derive confidence in the exterior. 
Look at the magazine rack at the store when you walk by and you, you have, you know, the rock out there just... We're obsessed with the exterior, with the dime, with our, the dust ball of our own body. We keep putting new paint on the old barn in an attempt to revive what once was. We want to look like we're coming straight out of central casting, like an actor. God says man cares about the outward appearance, but God looks at the... Amen. And as Pastor Josh preached on Sunday in Romans 12, we had to present our bodies, not the, not the physical bodies, but ourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. It means to take care of, not obsess over. How much time do we spend in front of the mirror? If it's more than we spend on our knees, we need to reevaluate our priorities. Are we on our knees in his word, looking to be conformed, renewed into his image as much as we do for ours? Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, honor God in our, in our bodies, which is our reasonable sacrifice. Do I spend an hour a day working out or an hour a day in my Bible? And guys, I'm not saying it's wrong to work out. A lot of us here need to work out more, for sure. We need to take care of the temple, okay? I'm not saying that. I mean, I work out. Can you tell? No? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll keep working. But guys, it's all about what do we care more about? Do we care more about the outside? Our outside is fading away. How much of my mind is consumed with material things? So we're obsessed with all these things on the exterior, and the interior needs to be renewed. We're, we're obsessed with our image. We're obsessed with our health. We're obsessed with our finances. At least I am. I can be. How much of my mind is consumed with material things? I'm not preaching against material wealth. The Bible says a wise man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. In 1 Timothy 6, he commands the rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but to put our hope in, in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We don't provide for ourselves, God provides for us. He calls us to certain responsibilities. He calls us to be faithful and provide. He calls us to work hard. He calls us to show up. But he says, I'm the one who provides for you. God has provided all this for our enjoyment. This wasn't here 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And look what he's done. He's provided this. How then shall we not trust him to continue to provide for us? Guys, we look for... We look for meaning in recreation, happiness, relationship, and hobbies. All these things are exterior, th exterior things that fade away. But the soul, our inward being, the spiritual component of myself, contrasted with the dying outward man, shows the two parts, the two things that we are composed of. It's very distinct. While the outward perishes, the inward is renewed. While one is enfeebled, the other is strengthened. While one ages and decays, the other renews its youth and is invigorated. One is not dependent on the other. Inner renewal leads to sweet and repeated experiences of the love of God. Who here wants sweet and repeated experiences of the love of God? I know I do. This comes as a result of inner renewal. We are growing daily in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ as we spend time in his word. We spend time on our knees in prayer. We spend time with fellow believers and we spend time with, the, our, with his body, the church. Like the children of Israel in Egypt, the more they were afflicted, the more they grew. This inward life, the spring of life within that can never fail, it's new life. It's the new life that comes from God through Christ when we accept him as our savior. We must focus on the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, church. Verse 17 says, and I love this, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Romans 8 verse 18 says, for I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Our suffering church right now is spread over time. It's working for us, not against us. It's working out 
what Jesus wants to refine us, to, com- to conform us more into his image, but we are not broken. This earthen vessel, a cracked pot, it refines us as we welcome it. We suffer here and now living in light of glory that's to be. The question is, am I living in light of this or am I living in the light of today? Am I living for today? If we are living in the light of eternity, this present affliction is but a proving ground for eternal glory. When we step into the presence of God, that's not spread over time. That glory is immediate. The full weight of glory is immediately upon us. We will step into his presence and fall on our face, overwhelmed with his perfection. We enter the presence of immeasurable glory, lasting beyond description. He says our earthly afflictions are temporary. They are light. They are tolerable in the light of the magnificence of what's to come. How's it happening? How are we renewed day by day? How do we not lose heart? Well, verse 18 says, as we look to the things that are seen, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, I have a question. How do we look to the things that are unseen? We need a better prescription. How do we see the things that are unseen? The look is that of one who contemplates this or that as the end or goal for which he strives. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, now faith is the assurance or evidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This is how we are called to walk. Jesus says, by faith and not by sight. That's how we see the unseen. We exercise complete trust and confidence in Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross on my behalf, his resurrection and his imminent return. The question is, are we focused on what's unseen? Have we lost sight of the unseen? What do we spend our time looking at? Guys, there's people in this world that have studied space and they take these magnificent telescopes and they, they dive deep into space. You know, they can see billions of light years away. They're looking for things that are unseen. They want to bring them into focus. They want to see the unseen. On a smaller level, we use microscopes, right? To take things that are, are very close to us and bring them into focus so that we can understand them better, Right? Daily renewal for us requires us to get out our microscopes and study the word so that we can keep our focus on the things that are unseen. Job was a man who refused to not see the unseen. You all know the story, right? He lost his children. He lost his wealth. His wife came against him. All his friends came against him. Satan came against him, attacked him. He was afflicted with boils, man of great wealth, losing everything. And you know what he said? Shall we receive good from God and not evil? He saw the unseen. In the midst of of the worst that life could throw at him, he focused on God. How can we live in the world that we live in today? I'm wrapping up here. How can we live in the world that we live in today? In the 20th century, there's more persecution of Christians than ever before on on this globe. There were more martyrs in the last century than the last 19 centuries before that. Righteousness is under attack. Now, more than ever, we need to love the Bible. We need to get in the Bible. We need to take our microscopes and we need to ask the Lord to reveal to us the unseen, to keep our eyes fixed on what's above, not on the things of the earth. Church, in summary, don't lose heart. Don't give up. Our earthly tent is fading away. It's breaking down. We need to be renewed daily on the inward, the part of ourself that will never die. 
A daily evaluation of our time and priorities is necessary. Where our time is, where our treasure is, where our thoughts are, that's where our heart is. Am I living with the eternal weight of glory in mind, or am I living for today? Revelation 21 and 22 describes this eternal weight of glory. It's a stunningly beautiful city having streets of gold, gates of pearl, and walls made of precious stones. It is brilliantly illuminated by the glory of God himself. A river of water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the new Jerusalem. All whose names are etched in the Lamb's books of life will enter as permanent residents. The tree of life, continuously available in abundance to all. There's no crying, there's no pain, there's no temporary affliction, there's no death, there's no sadness, there's no cancer, there's no financial difficulty, there's, there's only eternal peace and joy. It's the holy dwelling of the Lord Most High and we will live together with him for eternity. Don't lose heart. Focus on the things above, not on the earth. Run the race well, our prize awaits us at the end. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. May the Lord bless and keep you. Thank you.